morning, ladies and gentlemen. Very warm welcome to Food Drinks Europe webinar on the plastic problem, can we collect, recycle and sort enough? This is the first event of the Food and Drink in Five format. Nothing to do with your five a day, but an attempt to bring a new flavour to the typical Brussels panel discussion. We're throwing away the irrelevant chit chat, bland cliches and chewy introductions in favour of the rhetorical main course, the rich, delicious discussion. We're going to do that by talking through five big questions which should guide us through the crunchiest issues it's a kind of tasting menu for ideas. For the first event in this format, we'll be tackling a tough issue which affects industries worldwide, not just food and drink, plastic waste. The European Commission's new Circular Economy Action Plan takes aim at plastic pollution with the goal of ensuring that all packaging becomes reusable or recyclable by 2030. That's ambitious because currently less than half of plastic packaging waste is recycled. Most of it goes to landfill or is incinerated. Clearly, we can do better, but how? I'm sure you'll all be aware that the European Parliament is going to be voting on these proposals on December the 7th. We've got a great panel today who can share their insights ahead of this crucial day. Over the next 50 minutes, we will be discussing how the food and drink industry can help play its role in achieving these targets through five key questions. The discussion that we have today shouldn't end here. We've got over 400 of you registered, lots of you logged in, everybody listening and joining in. Um, so, you know, this shouldn't stay just on the call. Uh, we should continue the discussion. And the hashtag to do that is Sustainable Food EU, all one word, obviously. Our panellists, we've got Maria Spiraki, who's an MEP for Neo Democratia, part of the EPP group and co-chair of the Intergroup on Climate Change, Biodiversity and Sustainable Development. <laughs> She's also a member of the ITRE and BIC committees, so has lots of insight to relevant chat. Philippe Dierksen, who I can see perfectly now. Good yeah, morning, Philippe. I'm yes. so glad we've uh, smoothed out those issues, so that's fantastic you're here. Philippe is the Environment Manager at Danon Waters. He's an expert in environmental chemistry and packaging waste management. Jean-Marc Simon is Executive Director of Zero Waste Europe. He's long been a leading voice for zero waste in Europe and is a member of the Steering Committee on the Break Free from Plastics Movement. He's also written several books on the subject. Uh, Werner is a policy officer working on the circular economy at DG Environment in the Commission. He's responsible for natural <coughs> policies, including promoting life cycle thinking to induce the environmental impact of waste and the directive on single use plastic. Very, very briefly, I'll introduce myself. My name is Francis Robinson. I'm a freelance journalist and moderator. I was in Brussels for seven years with the Wall Street Journal. I was in Frankfurt with Bloomberg before that, the assistant in Paris too. Now I'm stuck back in, uh, well, it's quite sunny actually, but basically cold Brexity London, missing the Eurostar, missing Wall Street. It's a bit tough, but it's great to be here virtually. It's Sustainable Food EU. So we're gonna start with question one. Brilliant. So is packaging always necessary? Joanne Mark, you've literally written the book on this, so why don't you kick us off? All right. Well, um, hello, everyone. I'm happy to be here. Um, so is packaging always necessary? Um, I would say it depends. I mean, there are times when it's more necessary than others. But we will agree that in Europe today, we have a problem probably more with overpackaging than with too little packaging. And at least what I can say is, as from the movement of zero waste, we see that our constituencies are already voting with their feet and actually moving to packaging free shops because um, in a way or another, they don't trust the packaging that is out there. That doesn't mean that they don't use packaging. They use the, your, their own packaging. Um, and uh, maybe that's uh, what they trust. I think that what we are discussing here today, though, is, is not whether packaging is necessary, but rather whether single-use plastic uh, packaging is necessary and, and how much sense does it make from a resource management perspective to use a single-use plastic for packaging at the, at the levels that we're doing today. Brilliant. That's a really good start uh, because, yeah, it's good to narrow down the focus of the discussion so we don't get too distracted. Well, do you want to talk us a little bit through the process at the Commission when you went through thinking about um, how everything works when you were drafting the legislation? OK, I, I hope this works now. Good morning. Perfect. Can hear okay. you. So good morning all. Um, 
Well, yeah, what is what is packaging and what is necessary? Necessary is, is, is a very difficult word. Huh? Uh, we often tend to look at over packaging and there again, when when I look at it, uh, I, I see it. I mean, last week, like, like all of us, I'm in, in a lockdown, I ordered a small thing, 10 centimeters, and I got it in a box of half a meter long and okay all other huge dimensions and then you really see it this is over packaging clearly the issue is how do you put that in legislation and that's a much more difficult thing now uh juan already uh put it in the next step and and mentioning single use packaging single use plastic packaging even um that's it's completely different question because then we need to to see where reuse would be better than single use most often it is that's why it is in our race hierarchy and in our circle economy approach and you really try to to look at that the same as with reduce uh, we have written that very clearly in our new circle economy action plan and we really intend to have that an extremely close look the problem will be how to define that and how to put that in legislation and that's where we would be very very happy to receive your help great perfect uh and you know a nice setup because now we can come to philly so obviously there's a lot which is specific about the food and beverage industry do you want to talk us through your perspective on necessity of packaging yes thank you uh, good morning everybody um so of course, to that question, there is no single answer. Huh? Uh, it depends on the sensitivity of uh, food products to, to contamination, but also to external factors uh, such as air, humidity, etc. Um, packaging has a fundamental role to play to protect the products. And if food products or beverages are deteriorated or comes to uh, in not good shape to the consumer we we will be the first uh, to be uh, accountable for that so for us uh, the role uh, for, uh, of packaging is uh, absolutely important but of course to the that specific question is packaging always necessary of course the answer is no uh, all of us we are going to the market we can, we can buy fruit and veg vegetables without uh, without packaging you have also some uh, groceries who are selling uh, in bulk, some dry food, some also some olives, some vinegar, some oil. When you have the opportunity to bring your own, your own packaging to those stores, those are new concepts of selling products. And uh, so clearly the answer is no. But the role of packaging is absolutely essential for uh, sensitive uh, food products, to protect sensitive products. Brilliant. Uh, I like how we're already talking a bit about the role of the consumer. We do have a zero waste shop just near where I live, and it also has a make your own peanut butter machine. So I have got twin toddlers, and that's a huge incentive for me to get organised, clean the bottles and jars and take them along because you can press the button on the peanut butter machine. Brilliant, Maria. The Parliament obviously does a lot, represents citizens, consumers. Uh, it does a lot to protect food safety questions as well. So what are your thoughts on the necessity of packaging? I think that uh, at the very first level, we have to have that uh, it is important to understand some kind of the parliament that uh, packaging is consisting. The first one is safety and how can we have uh, a safe and proper product uh, by by packing date, by best before the date, by list of ingredients visible on the packets. And the second one is the, the part of the attractiveness for the consumer in order to, to have this product. Two thirds of the people confirm that uh, packaging affects their buying decision. In this regard, I think that it is obvious that uh, uh, we have to, to understand that packaging is essential, especially at the food industry, without compromising in terms of food safety and hygiene. But also, we would like to have your contribution, and it is important to have stakeholders' contribution, in order to commit to reduce excessive packaging and to develop more efficient and circular packaging solutions, as well as to encourage initiatives like Circular Plastic Alliance and Plastic Packs. It is important to go hand by hand, not only to have the proper legislation, but also to have the proper implementation and the engagement of the consumers in this regard. 
Brilliant. Okay, this is perfect, guys. You're absolutely doing brilliantly with the format. I'm going to make that five minutes exactly. So let's keep this momentum going and move on to question two. Should have a little video again there, guys. Great. So question two, how do you score the EU's current plastic collection and recycling rates? Um, it's a good moment, I guess, to think about the EU as a whole, but also I'm sure there are individual countries, individual companies that have got best practices that we can all learn from. Well, I guess you had a pretty thorough look at the kind of state of play when you were thinking about the legislation. So do you want to tell us a bit more about what the Commission saw? Well, thank you. I, I, I think the Commission thoughts. Um, I would like first to go to the facts. Huh? Um, if, if you look at the EU's current plastic collection and recycling rates in, in general for plastics, then for plastics, then it would be around 32 uh, percent. Packaging waste generated in 2017, last the time we have the complete figures, reached a total of a bit more than 14 million tons. Of this one, and this is just on packaging, plastic packaging, around 42% is collected for recycling. So it's a bit higher than, than the figure for uh, plastics in total. But 42% collected for recycling. Under the new calculation rules, they would be lower. The Netherlands, for instance, estimates this, discrete, this decrease for their national statistics in the order of around 10%. If you then compare it with all packaging waste, there we reach around 68% collected for recycling and most probably with high effective recycling rates as well. So if you just look at figures, plastics has a long way to go. Just want to add one little thing. We do know that plastics is a more difficult material to recycle. That's, by the way, why we set up so much work on the design of plastics. I'll leave you to this. Brilliant. And that brings us very nicely on to you, Philippe. If we're going to talk about kind of design, you know, recycling by design, thinking about that stage, what have, uh, have you got any examples from the industry you'd like to share? Uh, yes, sure. In fact, uh, there is one particular material that already started very early to to design, to issue design for recycling guidelines. It is PET. It is more today than, than 10 years ago that we created uh, the, the European PET bottle platform, where we uh, clearly um, decided with all the plastic value chain, the PET plastic value chain, for clear uh, um, rules. Uh, to to communicate to um, uh, plastic manufacturers, to PT uh, manufacturers, to bottle uh, PT bottle manufacturers, to to tell them the way we encourage uh, to 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 make the PT bottles. And in fact, today, no company has any excuse anymore to place on the market a PT bottle that is not perfectly recyclable. If you go to the website of the European PT bottle platform, you will see a kind of traffic light system with in green what we encourage to do, in yellow what is conditional, and in red what we absolutely ask not to do because it hampers the, the recycling. So it is really a very powerful tool that we use since more than 10 years. So it's, it's absolutely not, not new. And uh, today, there are more and more uh, incentives to uh, to communicate design guidelines for other uh, plastic material because it is important that we do it for all uh, the plastic, but also for all the packaging material that we use. And I know that there is a lot of work do, uh, on the go uh, for uh, polyethylene, for polypropylene, for, uh, for for polystyrene and other and other polymers. Brilliant. Um, that's uh, very handy. Thank you so much. And brings us on very nice to the first question from the floor, or rather, I suppose, the ether, which has just landed, uh, which shares, in reference to Werner's anecdote, how do we define overpackaging? It's difficult to understand what excess packaging is considering that sometimes packaging, even when it looks disproportionately big, can be necessary for safety, transport, convenience, etc. So it is true, sometimes things come in giant boxes because it makes it easier to stick it on a pallet and go on a train or in a van or whatever. 
but then sometimes things just come massively overpackaged. Uh, Jean-Marc, do you want to come in on this one? Um, that's uh, that's the key of the question, right? Um, as Fernand was saying, I mean, how do you put that into legislation? Packaging, after all, is subjective. I mean, you can have a producer thinking that it's putting the right amount of packaging and the, and the consumer saying, like, why am I getting all this stuff when I just ordered this little piece? Um, uh, so I don't think we can look at overpackaging as an isolated item. I think that overpackaging is a result either of an effort from marketing perspective to sell your product or the result of, because of the logistics, uh, overprotecting uh, packaging. Um, what, what I don't know if this is that if you look at the root causes of overpackaging, normally it's associated to long supply chains, long distribution chains, um, and also the sophistication of the product that you are selling. If you're selling, I don't know, say almonds, for example, it's quite unlikely you're going to get them overpackaged. If you're selling a USB stick, for example, or you're selling, I don't know, processed food, that's more likely to come with more packaging. So actually, um, that's a special way to intervene in this. But um, Perfect. Uh, and just very briefly, I don't know whether you have on thoughts on uh, the kind of current collection and recycling rate, coming back to Ben's stats, whether we are going further. Yeah. Um, I agree that the, the, the data we have uh, doesn't show very good results. I would only add that even these results that are not very good are sometimes, I think, a bit um, not realistic. We know of some concrete cases at the local level where some data is reported that is above what, you, what is being collected. And again, this is, this is data for collection for recycling. It doesn't mean that it's actually effectively recycled. It's very difficult today with the current uh, methodology. With a new one, uh, probably it's going to get better, but to know actually what is effectively recycled from the point of view of like turning a bottle into a bottle. We do know that there are, there are systems that are more efficient than others when it comes to separate quality and quantity. We know that there's BRS systems in Europe that provide very good capture rates and very good quality for that allows for high quality recycling. The, the question here is, this works for beverage packaging. But food packaging is it's it's works with bigger amounts even than beverage packaging. So how do we address how do we set up effective, efficient systems for collection for food packaging? Uh, for example, I think that that is that is a key question. Great, and uh, this is kind of brings us back to the difficulty of getting a kind of uniform picture of the whole of Europe when things are so diverse. I mean, I know that I moved from one London borough to another. And it changed which plastics I could recycle. You know, the sort of uh, sturdy trade that the mushrooms come in. That's okay in Lewisham, but not okay in Southwark, I expand. So, Maria, I guess, you know, you at the Parliament are kind of confronted with all of this data, you know, not quite sure uh, how effective things actually are on the ground. Um, you know, what, 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 what score would you give to the EU currently? Well, I would like to start with uh, from the point that Werner stops in order to confirm that, unfortunately, according to OECD report, last year plastic recycling continues to be an economically marginal activity. And I would like to underline this. It is, is an economically marginal activity. And of course, there are a lot of reasons uh, focusing on the diverse set of materials that we face in terms of recycling plastic. You know, it is poor availability, it is the low quality, it is the profitability of the plastic waste, which is very low. And in this regard, I think that we are facing in, in a lack of investments as well, a lack of investments in waste management infrastructure and in recycling technology. I think that the circular economy is the way for the EU and the European companies to remain competitive in the global market by providing uh, recyclable plastics, by providing recyclable pack packaging, by, by providing reusable plastic, uh, by packaging. Therefore, I think that the direct investments are needed to scale up the circular economy initiatives focusing on, pla on, on packaging. And it's not only the, the PAT or the HDPE. I mean that we need more. We need greater investments in the development of recycling technology. It, and it is a key to achieve the EU circular economy targets. I think circularity is the point in this regard, and not only recycling 
the, the package in Gajwe now. Brilliant. Perfect. Thank you so much. So there's this question of investment that I think we'll come on to a bit more later as well, like how, uh, who, uh, and what's going to be the most effective way. In the meantime, let's keep pushing forward. So we're going to go on to question three. Should have a little video for you now. <coughs> All right, brilliant. Here we go. So question three, what are the barriers to plastic recycling? Uh, Maria, I, I loved your enthusiasm about uh, investment and going forward. Perhaps if we can uh, to talk a little bit about the barriers, because you know, as an MEP, you're in touch with people. What do you think are the, are the barriers that we currently face? I think that uh, we face two main barriers. Allow me to, to make some kind of, of parameters in this regard. The first one is that the consumers are not very well aware on the concept of circularity. 84% uh, of the consumers feel bad about throwing things away according to a study, but globs can. At the same time, they are not very familiar with the procedure of circularity. So it is important to have a, a, a kind of framework in order to have a common collaborative action between different stakeholders from citizens, private initiatives, entrepreneurs, NGOs, policymakers, academia. And this is the first. The second one, and I think it is of paramount importance, is the creation of well-functioning, of a well-functioning at EU level market for secondary materials. And it is a necessary precondition for, uh, for reducing Europe's dependency on primary sources, and in this regard, for strengthening the strategic autonomy, for competitiveness, and for increasing the, the, the implementation of circular <clears throat> economy action plan. I think that we need both the engagement of the people and, uh, and the creation and the stability of a second uh, raw material market. Brilliant. So it's a nice combination there of uh, consumer-led and market-led solutions. Philippe, uh, what barriers do you see from within the industry? Um, and maybe you want to pick up on the point that was made about investment too. Well, there, there are a lot of courses. Huh? So you have... Uh... Uh, we can mention the lack of collection, sorting, and recycling infra infrastructure in some countries. Um, also, that too much valuable plastic material is exported outside the EU, and all the discussion with the Basel Convention need uh, to be to be uh, tackled, reinforced, etc. It's a very important uh, topic for the future. Um, sometimes also the limited access to recycling bin containers. Um, the, the, the lack of consumer awareness. Um, also, I take all the points, uh, the, the one after the other, but you have also the, the two low prices of virgin plastics, which is uh, which give, give uh, not the, the really the possibility to companies to, to buy recycled plastics uh, because there is there is always a cost uh, cost issue. And um, also the, the, the EU food contact material legislation that is uh, still not sufficiently uh, adapted. Um, now, the positive message that I want to, to, uh, to communicate is that a lot is on the go. I never saw uh, so many associations and initiatives that are created now since uh, more than uh, one or two years to improve the situation. You have the creation of the Circular Plastic Alliance, you have the creation of the Polyolefin Circular Economic Platform, the PSEP, and you have the creation also of another association more concentrated on the recycling of Styrenix, the Styrenix Circular Solution. You see, there is a really a lot of uh, enthusiasm in the recycling of plastics and that, uh, that gives me hope for the future. Oh, great. Always nice to be upbeat about these things. Um, Jean-Marc, I've got uh, another question from the floor. Sorry, they always seem to land when you're coming <laughs> when you're coming up, but it's also uh, builds nicely on what we, we, we've touched on in terms of the barriers, uh, this kind of market factors, there's the fact that waste is exported, kind of a bit of a dirty secret there. Uh, and then there's um, uh, the, the question from the floor, so is the market of our pet, which I'm told is a very relevant plastic to this discussion, ready to supply producers with uh, adequate quantities? If not, what is the barrier? And there's, you can't see this, but there's a question mark and an exclamation mark. So clearly, you've got to imagine we're in the room, that question's being asked very thoughtfully, John Mark. Um, so yeah, the market for recycled PET um, 
is is not providing enough uh, volumes for what the, the demand is in Europe. Um, yet, I would like to underline that um, in the current economic crisis, the recycled PET market is the, the, is probably the only success in plastic recycling today. is the only um, recycling sector in the plastics that is still. Uh, profitable and it's not profitable because of the price of recycled PET. I underline that it's profitable. Well, it's profitable. It's it's working because there's EU uh, targets that actually put an obligation for recycled content of uh, PET. We don't have such an obligation for other uh, polymers, and that explains why, in a situation in which the oil prices are so low, and I think that that's that for me the the, the key of the whole thing. Um, I think that we are artificially trying to create a market for a commodity, but there's no market, in a sense, and I'm putting it quite harsh here. Um, for as long as oil prices are going to be low, recycling plastic is going to be um, too expensive, unless it's obliged by law. And considering the prices of the renewables going low, it's quite unlikely that the prices of oil are going to increase because otherwise they cannot be competitive. So we're looking at the future that in the long term, oil is going to be cheap. So the only way to make plastic recycling viable is actually to intervene in the market in a way or another with, with taxation, be it with uh, taxation for virgin plastic or with um, recycling uh, content quotas, etc. To make sure that recycling happens, because if we leave it to the market, it's not going to happen. And and I and I think we need to look beyond PET. I think PET is the success story of the plastic. The rest of polymers are still very much lagging behind. I mean, beyond beyond two or three polymers, most of the other polymers are not uh, recycled. We and they're still part of the extended use responsibility schemes. We pay for it, but they are not uh, recycled. So I think that. Um, um, we need to intervene to make actually plastic recycle, recycling uh, profitable, or at least uh, happening, because today is really struggling. Great. Uh, and that, I mean, you know, put it in a nutshell, that what actually made a difference was having EU targets and what was having laws. So, well, and this is a great moment for you to build on this enthusiasm and uh, talk, talk about uh, how you're going to overcome these barriers. Um. Well, I, I think first of all, we have already put quite a lot of things into motion. Um, and, and the problem with this kind of policies that we have put into motion is that their results are not from today to tomorrow. And that's logic. I mean, it's a huge market. We have a plastic strategy. We have, uh, Philip said it already, the Circular Plastic Alliance that we have set up with businesses. Uh, we have our waste policies that we reviewed completely two years ago. We have new waste collection targets as well for uh, particular on plastic packaging, 50% uh, by 2025, 55 by 2030. Uh, and we have set as well in the plastic strategy, uh, all the things that we're going to do. Uh, the main one on the subject of today is to make all plastic packaging recyclable because that's as well intervening in the market. Uh, you can intervene in the market at the end, but you can as well intervene at the market in the beginning where we want to change the essential requirements as they are laid down in the packaging and the packaging waste directive. But we're going as well to look at uh, the, the fee modulation at working how we can improve potentially uh, some extended produce responsibility schemes. Some of these things will be regulatory initiative. Some of these things might be rather guidance. Uh, we have to work in the European context that we have. Huh? The Commission can propose quite a lot of things. We obviously need to work together with the Parliament and the Council, which is going very, very well. But it takes time, and then the most important thing, very often with waste policies, but not only, is that you have the matter of subsidiarity or the competence. Sometimes we can act at the European level, sometimes we cannot. <clears throat> and that equilibrium is not, not, always, uh, not always easy. But we, we are trying, and I think we need to intervene on all parts of the market, starting at the design and then going all through the circle 
and closing the circle is with recycled content. Now with recycled content, the, so the initiative on the CPA, Circle Plastic Alliance, which aims at um, 10 million tons of uh, new, res, uh, no, of recycled content and new products put on the market by 2025. I think you all know that. You probably know as well that we will take legislative initiatives in parallel with these on packaging, on um, vehicles and on construction products. Uh, we will look in those initiatives to see if we can set up uh, recycled content targets for plastics. Now, um, recycled content targets, they are very attractive on paper. They are extremely difficult to put in, in practice. The different, the number of different plastic pro uh, products on the market is enormous. Uh, packaging is 40%, extremely important, but you have a lot to cite that. Um, then the other thing is that the number of polymers, the number of combination of polymers that are possible, and then we still have to talk about additives. Uh, it, it is complicated. Now, it's not because it's complicated that we can't do anything, but it doesn't make life easy. But we are, we are looking at that. Huh? Um, I'm already going into the next question. Do you want me to go on, Francis, or do I wait a bit? Uh, I go, let's have the little video and we'll come to the next question. Perfect idea. There we are. Hey, guys. Brilliant. So there we are. Very nice natural bridge here into question four. So we, we've heard a bit about barriers and we're going to go into how can we improve recycling rates, particularly in food packaging. So uh, when did you want to finish that thought? <laughs> go on. Oops, perfect. OK, I, I had muted myself. Sorry for that. <laughs> um, so we in. The main thing, the main instrument we have on the subject of today is the packaging and the packaging waste directive. Huh? And there we are looking at a couple of things. The first one is to put up an enforceable definition of recyclable packaging. Uh, we most probably will go to a, a quite general definition and then probably with some additional guidelines or list of negative and positive lists of what we would call recyclable. Um, well, this is this is ongoing. Huh? By the way, we are having I don't know how many studies and associated stakeholder consultations on all these kind of aspects. We are looking as well if we could preserve some materials only for some applications. That would be, uh, I think, very clear, a very good thing for recycling. But not all firms would be happy with with this kind of thing. So we need. To, to look at it. Some, some clear examples of, for instance, some compostable plastics only for very specific applications so that there are no cross-contamination cross could, could happen. Or for instance, looking at PET for food grade. We're looking at that. I'm not saying that we're going to do that. Right. The, the thing for less complexity of materials and polymers is, is important as well. Uh, it is clear when you mix paper and plastics that it should be extremely easy to separate those things in either in the collection, either in the, the sorting recycling phase. Um, I mentioned already the issue on recycled content targets. And then we're looking at some, some associated instruments, for instance, minimum mandatory GPP criteria and related targets that, that we, we could have. And those instruments, now I'm focusing on recycle, recycling recyclability, but we will look at all this as well um, with waste prevention and reuse in, in our thoughts. Uh, but I think I'll leave it to here. Brilliant. OK, that's perfect. That's a lot to think about. So question four, what, you know, what can we do to improve things? Um, well, I mentioned designing, you know, designing and recyclability. Um, I've got a question from the floor, which I guess is mainly aimed at Philippe, saying packaging is a fundamental part of the marketing and branding of consumer products. Does less packaging therefore mean less promotion? Um, so, you know, all of this sounds very much like your wheelhouse, Philippe. So why don't you uh, talk us through what you're doing? 
sorry, uh, absolutely didn't understood the question. Sorry, sorry. So the question is, uh, how can we improve recycling rates is the big group question. And then there's a question from the floor kind of aimed at you, but obviously all the panellists could come in saying packaging is a fundamental part of the marketing and branding of consumer package of consumer products. Does less packaging mean less promotion? Because I no. guess, yeah, if you have le less My real God. estate, less, yeah. My God, I'm not a specialist of marketing, but uh, <laughs> um, no, I don't think so. You, you, you always will need packaging that you, that you turn it on one way or another. So packaging will always have its place for, for some marketing and marketing is important. But I will not go further on that issue because I'm not a specialist again uh, uh, concerning marketing. Concerning the, the, how, to, how to improve, huh? how to improve the, the, um, the recycling rates, uh, particularly in food packaging, there are some very important things to say. First, we need to collect better quality. That is central because if you collect very bad quality, you will never be able to use it further to reintegrate uh, uh, the plastic in, in, uh, in other applications. So that is first. And how to do that? We need to increase research and development, particularly, for example, in enhanced recycling, so, such as chemical recycling. That is a topic that is brand uh, new now and that needs clearly to be, to be uh, uh, improved in the coming years. And then, fundamental, the collaboration in the value chain. Uh, in my opinion, nothing will be uh, will better increase collection sorting and recycling than constructive discussion and cooperation between packaging material producers, transformers, the users, the waste managers, waste management companies, uh, and the recyclers, of course. Huh? That is absolutely key. That is absolutely central. And Again, a positive message. I feel that those discussions, that those commitments of all the plastic value chain is really, really increasing since now, uh, let us say, two or three years. And that is very positive. And my, if there is a core message of today, it is, to, it is to encourage all the plastic value chain to continue on such constructive discussions. And then last but not least, of course, uh, improve the consumer information on all uh, aspects of uh, the need to collect, uh, the need uh, to sort, the, the, the usefulness of all what we are doing today, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Brilliant. So lots of room for discussion. Uh, great to hear that people are working together more and more. And the, the kind of how can we improve? brings us very nicely onto this question from the floor, which has just landed. Uh, I know I joked before about the last one having lots of question marks. This one's got all capitals, so definitely a serious, you know, something you've got to imagine, like ser serious asking here. It says, Maria says recycling is not so profitable. So Nordic rich countries have got a higher recycling rate compared to Southern countries. How are we going to manage this in the long term? Can we talk specifically about investment from the EU and member states in infrastructure? How and when is it going to happen? Where's the money? And so, you know, we've all kind of touched on R&D, on, uh, you know, the, the, the collection, the availability of bins, the availability of facilities, but all of this does take money. And we've kind of had a brief mention of the possibility of a plastics tax as well. So I guess improvement probably does cost money. Maria, do you want to pick up on, on this one? Of course, of course. And I think it's very challenging for me because, as you know, I come from Greece. We landfill approximately 80% of our waste. So it is important to, to increase rates. And uh, to start with, I, I think that uh, we have the proper legislation, but we have to go forward by, by doing something more, by harmonizing le legal requirements for facilitating the economy of scale, especially on, uh, on waste management. And of course, by having long-term investments, uh, by using also sources coming from the ne next generation in you. Focusing on the, on the issue as such, I think that uh, Philip has already uh, told that uh, we have to, 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 engage, to engage people. And it is important to say that we have to, to create a new a new mindset, a new mindset which will be based on on deposit refund schemes and also to extend uh, responsibility, uh, 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 to extend production responsibility schemes. In this regard, I think we will have a, a much more uh, 
uh, candidates, efficient candidates of collection of plastics, different different uh, uh, different sectors of plastic. And at the same time, it is important to understand that we have to to to, to increase the engagement of the people by by using by using uh, schemes like uh, deposit refund schemes, uh, market based. It is it is also important to have incentives. It is important to have target incentives that they uh, will facilitate the the producers to to work by closed loop and not to work in a, in an open loop as it is now. And the best intensive, for, according to my opinion, for the companies to use recycled materials in their products might be from a reputational standpoint rather than uh, through increased regulation. Perfect. It is true that people are so much more conscious. Um, I, you know, obviously, like a lot of people in lockdown, all of our shopping is delivered now. You know, we, we just do online shopping. And uh, I'm sure I shouldn't name brand name. So a, a large Italian pasta manufacturer, we got a box of pasta and it said on the front, you know, we've taken away the little plastic window, you know, so that you can just pop this straight in the cardboard recycling. And I thought, that's brilliant. You know, it didn't make any difference to me. I wasn't choosing it in a shop. Um, and it was so easy to just go pop in the bin. They're very handy. Brilliant, Jean Marc. Uh, let's come to you. Last question four uh, How can we improve recycling rates, investment, etc.? Yeah, thank you. Um, building on what has been said, I agree that um, that we need to provide more, more information. Um, and what I see today is that there's a big confusion. It's been said the consumers don't know what is recyclable, what is reusable, don't know what is. Um, recycled content, etc. I, I am worried about the amount of claims, sometimes false claims by producers on the packaging saying like 100% recyclable, 100% recycled content. What does that mean? How does that uh, impact? That's part of the marketing, of course. I mean, uh, it can, even if it's true, uh, it, it's part of marketing. So the question here is, how do we link the recycling, so the recyclers, the producers, and the consumers? And I think a way to do that, on top of what has been said, is um, it would be very easy to just like have an European label on the packaging that you would see like actually this packaging is reusable or this packaging is recyclable, but recyclable 20% or 80% because it's not the same that is recycled into, um, into polyester, for example, for clothes, than if it's a bottle is recycled into a bottle. And I think the important and key thing here is um, the, this label should actually be focused, should be based on real uh, recycling in place. That means that if in in a country there's no the recycling infrastructure or the collection infrastructure to recycle that uh, that packaging, then the consumer should know that. And and the best way to know that is that when you're buying that, say I have an option between a reusable product and an option and a product that even if it's PET, this country doesn't have the, the means to collect and and recycle this. So the consumer then can make an informed choice. The consumer today doesn't have this information. The producer can put anything in the market because in a way they just pay the responsibility fee and whether it's recycled or not, it doesn't impact them very much beyond that because they can still put whatever they want in the label. And the recyclers, they just get the breadcrumbs here. They just end up recycling PET and uh, FTP and something else, but then they get a lot of crap. So actually creating this link between consumer producer and recycler and providing uh, this transparency to the market, I think it would uh, make lots of good. Brilliant, perfect, thank you so much. So, food three and five, uh, we've got five questions and I think we've left ourselves very neatly with five minutes to tackle the last one. So let's have the video for our final question. Brilliant. So there we are. Final question. Uh, let's get our crystal ball out and have a little gaze. Will the EU meet its goal to ensure all packaging is reusable or recyclable by 2030? So we've got about a minute each to think about this. Shall we go? Philippe, do you want to go first? Yes, absolutely. I'm absolutely convinced that we will be there. Unfortunately, I will be retired at that moment and <laughs> I will not have the possibility to collaborate, but I will still continue to follow the, 
the performance of uh, the companies and also the collaboration with the Commission. Uh, yes, absolutely. I think that um, the EU will meet its goal for all what was uh, what has been said before. Um, the fact that we will have for all material design for recycling guidelines, the fact all the what uh, will be done via the circular plastic alliance, um, all what will be done via the created uh, recently created association that I was mentioning before, the, the the company commitments. Look at all those company commitments around plastic and around, and around packaging in general. Uh, I'm absolutely sure that all the companies are now working to those to that goal. Uh, to recycle, to reuse all the packaging placed on the market. And last but not least, well, the role of legislation. We have now, we have to say it, very tough legislation on packaging. Uh, telling you that we were very glad about that will be lying, of course. Huh? Uh, but the legislation is there. We have to, to um, follow the instruction of the legislation. And for example, that goal of collecting collecting 90% of the PET bottles uh, in 20, what is it, 2029, is a very, very tough uh, objective that we will absolutely uh, need to, uh, to achieve uh, via uh, more performance extended produce responsibility schemes or via deposit refund schemes. But we go there and I'm absolutely sure that we will uh, reach the goal. Great, perfect. Uh Maria, do you want to go next? And possibly I've got one last question on the floor, which is how important is plastic for food safety and how can the EU ensure that recycled plastic is safe to be in contact with food? So I know, but this is a skill that MEPs have to condense things. So are we going to reach the goal and how do we make sure plastic is safe for food? Indeed, we can we can guarantee it by, by setting standards by setting sufficient standards that they will be implementing by all, all stakeholders involved. And I think this is, this is very, very easy to do. It is easy to, to have the proper, uh, the proper legislation. We have already had it in, in, a, in a huge part. But uh, allow me to, to go ahead with the main question, because I, I hear Philip very, very carefully, but I cannot, I cannot share his, his optimism to the future for 2030, I think we have to do more. I think we have, first of all, to streamline the legislation and to monitor the implementation for every and teach member state and region. It is important also to involve stakeholders and to encourage them to, to, to adapt best practices. As an, as an example, I think that Nestlé is a pioneer in this regard on packaging, and I think that we have to follow best practices in this regard. Of course, to raise awareness to the consumers and to engage consumers with, uh, with market-based models like deposit refund schemes, and to have, uh, to have significant much more uh, in, candidate, in terms of candidate extended producer responsibility schemes in order finally to have uh, an economically activity which is profitably and not economically magical, marginal activity such as recycling plastic right now. Brilliant. Sean Mark? Um, so yeah, no, I, uh, I think that even 2030 it's a bit too too far on the line. I, I would like that actually Philip gets to see this in place before he retires. So I think that we could we could I, I think that it would be a political sign if by twenty twenty five if by twenty twenty five um we already can have the packaging that is um reusable or recyclable. What I would like to see by twenty thirty is that all the packaging is recycled. Because the fact that it's recyclable, and again I've seen that in the chat. I mean, that's, that's a discussion in itself. What is recyclable? A chemist will have a completely different uh, definition than a recycler. And what is economically recyclable, etc. So I think that by 2030, I would like to see all packaging, single-use packaging in the market being recycled. By 2025, I would like to see that um, we are quite strict. We have five years to detect if there's a packaging that in five years we don't manage to find a way to have a recyclable solution, then maybe we need to like rethink the product or rethink the means of selling that product. But, and I'm sure there's going to be less than 5% of the market and we could even look at exemptions for that. But I think it's important to like move quicker than 2030. Brilliant. And then where did you want to finish off? Maybe touching on that food safety question as well as uh, 
of course, on the target. Uh, yes, thank you. Well, food safety, uh, it has to be. Uh, there's, there's just no compromises on that. Um, by the way, I saw a question as well, if we're working together with our Santi colleagues. Of course we are. I find this kind of extremely strange questions. We are co working together with all colleagues within the services. Uh, we might have different viewpoints during the elaboration of a process, but we always come up with a common process and a common solution. Um, and obviously making food contacts uh, working not only for PET, but as well for other plastics is very high on the agenda. Uh, unfortunately, this takes a little bit longer than we all would have hoped. And this is a little bit the same thing as with uh, Juan Mark. He does brilliantly his, uh, his, um, his call for even quicker attainment of targets, and that's his role. Uh, but I will be, it will be, it will be a huge challenge. I think it will be already be a challenge to do that in 2030, but we have no choice. We have to. This is part of the political ambition of the Commission, as, as mentioned in the Green Deal. But we don't not only need to do it because some commissioners have put that in a document. We just have to do it because sustainability is not a choice. It is what we all have to do. Not, not just for the economy or for the environment, but for our own well-being and making all plastics recyclable and then recycle as much as possible just is part of that as a couple of other things. And of course, this all needs to be done in an inclusive and economically correct manner. But yes, we will, we will manage. And we as the commission, we will do everything that we can to put the instruments into place and, and when I'm here, all the colleagues here around the, the table, I think they will all do that together with us because it's not just a thing of the commission, it's something from all of us. And that uh, we will work through that. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much. It's great final thoughts to go away from. So today I think we've all learned a lot about infrastructure and markets, about consumers. Still feel bad that 84% of us feel guilty about throwing things out. I know I do. And a lot about food safety. Thank you so much to our tech team for making everything run smoothly. A huge, huge thanks to our panellists and hopefully see you all again at the next Food and Drink in Five. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thank you.